Okay, please don't let me forget my cell phone. Um, I'd like to say thank you to Michael Vassar and the Singularity Institute for inviting me to talk. And I guess um, my uh, title of my talk uh, today is uh, The Quantified Self, although um, after the talks yesterday, I think uh, I could retitle it um, All Hail Our New Machine Overlords. Uh, I, I, actually, I'm going to talk about the macroscope, um, which is a new scientific instrument uh, that uh, we're using uh, to reorganize our understanding of ourselves, of humanity. Uh, it's a short talk, so I'm going to flash the one thing I think you'll probably remember from the talk, uh, but I won't talk about it until later. Um, the macroscope, what, uh, what, what do I mean by that? Let's start with the definition. I mean computers plus large data sets gathered in nature. Now, um, by nature, I mean, we, everything we do is in nature, so, um, but I, I mean nature in the sense that uh, natural scientists use it, you could say, gathered in the field, maybe, if you're familiar with ecological research. So, gathered under natural conditions as opposed to in a laboratory. Um, a few years ago, actually, let me go back a second and say this uh, I idea, the idea that there's a new scientific instrument called a macroscope that's evolving, or that we're making, is uh, not my own. Uh, it has a very interesting and actual four-decade history of sort of evolving and changing its meaning. I'm going to skip that, of course, today, but I will uh, mention uh, one person, uh, Jesse Ausubel, who is a uh, climate scientist at Rockefeller University, but also exercises some influence over science as a program officer at the Sloan Foundation, used this word in a talk, a very um, uh, interesting talk that he gave uh, a couple of years ago uh, about the use of small snippets of DNA, the 600 to 700 base pairs, to do species identification at a cost of about two bucks a piece. And uh, this is a whole other story, very interesting one. It's very hard to know what creatures exist on the Earth. Uh, and if you're doing ecological research, it's very important to know it. What kind of beetle is this? What kind of ant is this? These are, these are problems that are so hard that ecologists actually have a name for their difficulty. It's called the taxonomic impediment. You collect things, and you have to wait for taxonomists to identify them. And it's very painful and really can and put a dead end on your research. If you can do a little snippet of uh, the genome, 600 base pairs, 200 uh, two bucks a piece, rather, uh, which Polly Bear is doing in his lab in Canada for people, um, you can power through the taxonomic impediment, allowing people to gather research in the field who are not professional taxonomists, maybe ecologists, they may be scientists, but they're not taxonomists. Um, and uh, Jesse Alcibel called this sort of collaborative effort in which data is gathered and interpreted um, by a computer and then fed back to the scientist or the researcher, uh, the macroscope. And I wrote a story about that a few uh, years ago, um, a long story, I won't repeat any more of it here, but afterwards I started thinking about what about applying, what happens when we apply some of these techniques to, to humans? And so uh, co-conspirator uh, Kevin Kelly, who's also one of the founding editors of Wired, and I formed a group called The Quantified Self, and we meet every so often for a quantified self show and tells. And we have a blog called The Quantified Self, and it deals with self-tracking, self-analysis, self-knowledge through numbers, really, is the theme. Um, uh, so much to say there, but I'll go in quickly. I'll just say, if you, if, you, if you accept, if you'll stipulate with me that there is something called the macroscope, what would you like to do with it? Um, I'd like to focus it, really, that, that should probably say measure. You'd like to measure with it. Uh, you'd like to aggregate your data. You'd like to calibrate it, find out how good is your data, and of course you'd like to run some experiments. Let's talk about focus or measuring. This is obviously one way to get numbers on, on yourself. Uh, in, in particular, this is uh, to get some analysis of how you're sleeping. This is the lab version. You go into a lab and sleep. And uh, that's fairly precise. You get some good data. Uh, but the question, of course, is how closely does this resemble what happens in nature um, when you're sleeping at home? Um, it does, certainly doesn't look uh, very close. Um, and in fact, um, it's not. This is something that is, um, just came out, and I, I begged them to give me one to try before I came here, but I couldn't get a hold of one. They're having some the production limits, but it's called a Fitbit. It's basically an accelerometer plus algorithms, and it claims to be able to give you both your sleep and data about your sleep and about your caloric expenditure. Uh, I think sleep is easier than caloric expenditure, so we'll see how well they do. Um, 
but uh, I just put it up there to illustrate our trajectory. Uh, the first slide was a kind of precise measurement in an unnatural environment. This is probably a rather imprecise measurement, but it's something that you can wear all the time. And um, uh, the, the real way people are collecting data, though, about themselves doesn't, at this point, doesn't look so much like the Fitbit. Um, it looks more like this. This is uh, one of many, many uh, iPhone apps uh, that allows you to enter, uh, in this case, um, health data. Uh, this one's distinguished by some interesting ways of managing uh, privacy and sharing. Uh, it's called Polka. It's worth checking out. This is one uh, called Zoom Life, which I just put up because they have a, a brilliant solution to data entry, which is that you just make a voice memo and they have it transcribed for you and put into a database. Um, uh, this is, uh, slide is just to show that, of course, it's not the device that matters in this case, but the language that you speak in measuring yourself. Here, Buster McLeod in, in Portland has a wonderful blog called Enjoyment Land. Here he's tracking his energy focus, enjoyment, and stress. He's using a pencil and paper, but you can see the language that he's using to collect his data um, allows him to, collect, uh, to compare and, um, and aggregate uh, his, his scores and then do some experiments. Okay, so I could show you 100 things like that, but I think you get the idea. Um, you, you can measure things. Uh, now you want to collect the measurements, both your own measurements, aggregating your own measurements, and sharing them with other people. I'll show you just a few things. This is curetogether.com, where people are tracking chronic conditions. Here's a page uh, where people are tracking treatments for depression. Um, and uh, the yellow uh, is uh, um, people who are reporting the treatment that they're using is not working. The green is uh, the numbers of people reporting that the treatment is working. It's not time to go over it, but you get the idea. This is uh, patients like me, where people who have very serious chronic conditions, um, ALS, Parkinson's, are doing, uh, crowd, uh, are doing collaborative drug trials, um, often larger than the drug trials which led to the approval of the drugs they're using in the first place. Um, here, people are sharing their financial data on Wisabi. Here's the Public Genome Project. Here, just to get down to the very most crude and popular level, there are people who are using a tool called Tweet What You Eat. It's a calorie counter. A lot of people count their calories. Um, in this case, they're, what they offer is a crowdsourcing calorie count. So you enter a banana. You, you don't remember how many calories are in a banana. It automatically selects the most popular number for banana calories that there is. And this is like phone a friend, automated phone a friend. Like there are some things you can actually probably trust to the crowd and maybe um, how many calories are in a banana is one of them. Um, uh, okay, lots and lots of aggregation going on. Um, how good is the data? And here I just, I want to push this out to you because I think this is a place for some great experiments to be done. That data is being gathered. It should be calibrated. Let's take it and look at it, compare it to some things that we know are true, at least true according to laboratory experiments, and see, um, see what we learn about the conditions of gathering data in the field. I'll show you a really simple, good one. Um, can you compensate for the noisiness of home blood pressure measurements by taking more measurements? And, and how many more measurements do you need to take? Again, I don't have time to explain the whole slide, but you can see, in fact, yes, as you take more measurement, the standard deviation um, of uh, the difference between two blood pressure values, and these are mean values, I wish I could explain it all, but I hope you can get the idea, goes down a nice way. Um, you get about 80% of the measurement improvement in about 15 measurements. This particular experiment where they were testing drug uh, treatments for hypertension using home measurement, uh, they were doing three measurements a day, so 15 measurements, that's five days for the baseline. For, for a baseline that approaches the same error values of uh, the, the baseline that you would get doing blood pressure measurements in a clinical setting. So that's pretty doable and um, pretty encouraging about something as simple as blood pressure measurement. Since that's so... Um, kind of trivial, probably, to many of you, I'll show you um, the one payoff here. Um, daddy, daddy, you bastard, I'm through. Does anybody recognize that line? Very good. Um, that's Sylvia Plath, a um, uh, poet who committed suicide. Poets are known to commit suicide more often than other writers. So uh, the Penna Baker had the idea, um, uh, well, could you look at the poetry and predict using methods that Bella would like. You look at, the, look at the data, don't tell yourself who committed suicide or not, see if you can predict it um, uh, by looking at the poems. In fact, you can. 
And I just put this up. You do it in a really simple way by counting words. This isn't very complicated analysis. Count the words, put the words in categories, see if the poets use certain words in certain categories more than other poets. Yes, they do. Now, you see different categories of words here. You see a word daddy for family relationships. You could say a parents, you might put it in a category like that. You bastard, I'm going to call that a negative word, which is in fact what they call it in the study. You see I'm, first person pronoun, and you see the word through, which in this case is death. Daddy, daddy, you bastard, I'm through, is, is I think fit, could be fairly represented as a, as a statement about death. And in fact, it, the previous line is they've driven a stake through your fat black heart, you know, and so it, it's a very bloody poem. Okay, so which category? Family relationships, negative words, first person words, or death words do you think are correlated with suicide? Anyone want to? You are absolutely correct. That is, the, that is the correct guess. It's, it's the most counterintuitive guess and the correct one. Um, I'm. If you count the first person words, you get some pretty good data. Okay, that's poets, poems. That's a pretty rarefied data set here. Um, but, so let's see if we can do it with some other types of people and maybe some other types of language. Um, uh, this is Shannon Whit Whitsley Sturman and James Pennebaker. I should give them the credit for that. Um, here's college students, 2004 data on essays, a three segment essay. And they're picking up, using again first person, depressed and formerly depressed, not currently depressed, but formerly depressed college students using the prevalence of first person language in their essays. Okay? And I know about this research because. Uh, because a uh, person who came to one of our Quantified Self meetups, Bill Gerald, formerly at SRI, now at uh, University of California, Davis, is continuing along this line of research. And I don't want to jump on his results at all, but he did tell us uh, in an open public forum that they were now doing this work with um, just speech recognition software and quotidian speech, normal, daily, kind of unstructured interviews and other forms of gathering normal speech. So here you're starting to look at automatic, automated psychiatric classification using a monitoring of normal speech. Um, here you have something that is, you know, maybe will make you see that blood pressure data in a slightly new light. Okay, we're focusing, we're aggregating, we're calibrating, now it's time to experiment. Here I'm going to leave most of this to you. Your imaginations are as good as mine in terms of what kinds of experiments you'd like to see. I'm going to put up just a couple of slides. This is a cholesterol experiment. I put it up for one reason and one reason only, and that is for you to look at the n equals numbers, n equals 929, n, uh, n equals 737. These are subsets of the Framingham data. You're probably familiar with that. It's the most famous longitudinal study of uh, health data. Um, it had a, some, somewhere above 5,000 people tracked over multiple decades. Those are, that's a huge N. I mean, this is a famously large N, okay? That's as, that's as big as we get for this kind of research. There are some others, but, you know, just to get a sense of the scale. Um, I'm going to show you another number. This is uh, NIH-funded health studies. Around the world, there's about 27,000 of them. There's 150 on back pain, 100 on insomnia, about a couple hundred on cholesterol. Those are also huge numbers. This is at NIH. This is as big as we get in terms of projects to investigate humanity scientifically. Um, you know, they're not the only game out there, but they're the big, one of the big games, okay? Now I'll show you some experiments that we're seeing at the quantified self. They have different N. Um, they have N equals 1. Uh, this is Tim Lundeen, a software guy uh, uh, who um, was inspired by some stuff that Seth Roberts, another person who's been coming, has been doing to try to figure out what the right dose of DHA is to improve his cognitive alacrity. He's using a very, um, very simple method, 100 simple math problems timed. Uh, this is after the practice effect has taken place, so you're not seeing the effects of practice here. Okay, and he discovers that going from 400 to 8, uh, 100 gives him, you know, uh, a discernible effect in improving his speed of doing math problems. Uh, Seth Roberts decided, okay, I'll try that same method of getting a baseline and, and doing an experiment, and he also saw a pretty good, um, a pretty good result. Um, I put these up. There, there are many, many others. I put these up because I like them. They're kind of beautiful in their simplicity, but also because I want to raise the question of what does it mean to do an n equals one experiment? I think. Um, you know, the one way to look at this is this is sort of a narrow, even a selfish appropriation of the scientific method to achieve relatively small 
personal gains. Um, uh, I'd just like to ask you to consider thinking of it um, in a different context. Think of it um, instead as the cutting edge of an attempt to communicate better with machines, to make ourselves interpretable to machines, to speak a machine language so that machines can speak back to us. And I think the benefits of that are so clear that N equals one is sort of a, a, sort of a down payment on an N equals everyone future. And I'd like to invite you, if you're doing any of your own experiments, in, of this nature, doing any kind of self-tracking at all, have something to contribute, stop by the blog, come to a meeting if you want to. We're on meetup at, at quantifiedself.com, uh, uh, or start your own group, and we'll be happy to give you a hand. And if there's some time left, I'm happy to take some questions. Yeah, go ahead. conversations with Michael Vassar, who uh, uh -huh. wanted me to do an N equals one study on dual NBAC. And, you know, the thing that it just was a stopper for me is, okay, I might learn something about Rick Schwal, mm -hmm. but I could hear in his emails that he was thinking he was going to learn something about dual NBAC. And, you know, the number of variables that are not controlled Mm -hmm. very, very large, mm -hmm. very large, very large. So how you, you know, I just, you know, I'd learned something about Rick Schwal those days, those conditions, you know, the, the universe of measurements is really, really, really small. Yeah. And I just, I, I couldn't bring myself to say that's any kind of science. And yes, well, it depends on how you define science. Certainly, I don't think this is a, I think, you know, N, N equals one experiments are fairly common in, in, say, animal labs, animal learning, things like that. The control, the animal is its own control. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, you, yes, there's a lot of imprecision there, but think about the imprecision that occurs when you take a medical treatment, okay? Yes, you now know that this has been validated across, say, maybe a, um, a, a uh, clinical trial that has hundreds of people. But there are many ways in which those hundreds of people may differ from you. So you're trading off, in a sense, one type of imprecision, one type of um, error, potential error, for another type of potential error. And in many cases, what you're trying may be straightforward enough that you learn something, even though you may not, what you learn may not be generalizable, you know, say, to all humans. Um, all right, I'll throw in one last thing. And sure. I'll keep it really quick. Is Read a little bit on the fellow that invented nephrology. Uh -huh. Okay, understanding people by the bumps on their heads, all right? And he tried to do science before, you know, there were procedures, before people really right. had much grip on the scientific method. Right. And that's what he got, was nephrology, okay? So... Frenol okay, now I'm, now I'm phrenology. I'm okay. sorry. Um, yeah, I do know a little of that history. That I just think taking your blood pressure, changing an experimental condition and seeing if your blood pressure goes down is worth doing if you're trying to deal with your blood pressure. I mean, or, you know, there's many... Excuse me, Gary. <clears throat> oh, sorry. We're out of time. Okay, and it's, uh, it's phrenology. <laughs>